We welcome and are pleased to introduce our trainer today. Alicia Davis is a professional certified coach, former CT licensed massage therapist and partner in the coaching firm Transformative Leadership Strategies. She brings over 30 years of leadership development experience in the fields of holistic healthcare, social services, and behavioral health nonprofits, insurance, engineering, and corporate settings. She creates dynamic coaching and team building, team building experiences for leaders at all levels of an organization that address challenges such as organizational culture, team alignment, change management, communication, and high stress. Alicia offers a unique core energy coaching approach to individuals, executives, teams, and boards who are looking to achieve exceptional results. So nice to have folks on the call this morning. It's nice to see some of your faces. And I just always appreciate when folks can turn their camera on because it's so nice to look at a person's face as opposed to looking at a black box. So there is a, a summary page. It's just a couple of pages. Well, it's four, um, but it's really the highlights. So as we talk through the different slides, these are really some of the key um, practices, key thoughts um, and that we're going to talk about today. So that's what the handout is for. And if um, as we're going along in the in the slides, you can go back and forth and reference those as well. So decreasing stress through mindfulness. So let me just um, let me just talk a little bit about the sources of stress that are not just external, that are also internal. So here's the thing, how many of you, and actually I can, um, oh, the other thing is if you want to, you can in the view here when I'm sharing, you can actually go to the top of your screen and if you want, you can split the view so you can see the slides and um, other folks as well. So I'm just going to look. I'm curious, how many of you would, would say that this has been a really stressful year for you? Raise a hand. Give me a thumbs up. Yeah, of course, right? And so... What have you noticed are ways that your stress has, has manifested? How has, how has the, the year of the pandemic and the change of family, perhaps dynamics, because maybe you're working, well, actually, let me ask you this. How many are working from home? How many are doing like a hybrid kind of work where sometimes you're home, sometimes you're in an office. Okay. Um, how many of you um, have children at home that you're also homeschooling? Yeah. Okay. Um, how many of you have, um, have experienced um, clients or that, that people are having more and more um, needs around their mental and emotional support. Yeah, Jason, that's a big head shake right there. So, and all of us, right? All of us are, you know, you are supporting people that are really struggling and for so many reasons. And so, so I'm just looking at the, some of your comments that are coming in. So, so feeling headachey and wanting to sleep more, fatigue, absolutely. So much mental, emotional, physical drain and fatigue. Resistance from family and friends. So schedule that's busy, phone numbers never stops ringing answering the phone all the time. Yes. Thank you, Sylvia. So these are all of the manifestations of stress, right? And uh, yes, Sadie. So how many of you have experienced loss? How many of you have experienced loss? Loss of 
friends, like literally, whether it's lost through COVID or you've just lost other loved ones, friends, clients, you know, and we have all experienced a tremendous amount of loss, loss of freedom, loss of ability to see family and friends. Uh, yes, Rebecca, I'm so sorry about, yes, that your dad just passed. Ugh. Oh, Lori, your two sons. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yes. So much grief and so much loss. And so all of this has an effect on our mental state, right? Has an effect on our mind and our body and our heart. And so what we're going to just explore today is how do we handle our mental reactions and what this what this quote from Brian Tracy is talking about is just that that how we how we react in our minds how we perceive situations how we um, how we understand ourselves and our um, our reactions to things really can make a difference in in how we are feeling. And so this connection, and you all, you probably, of course, being care providers, you know this, you probably do this with, with clients and people that you're supporting and serving all the time is helping them just really have um, awareness about themselves, about their, the way that they're um, dialoguing in their minds and how it affects how they're feeling and how that affects the behaviors that they have and the choices that they make. And yet, as care providers, you might not give yourself that same kind of what I would call grace or kindness or compassion. Like you are so just busy giving it to everyone else and being impacted by all of what the world has brought that, um, that maybe you haven't really been able to take a lot of time for yourself. So first of all, I just want to honor that you're all here and that you chose to, um, to be here today. And one of the things that i like to talk about is the difference between being and doing. And so um, you and all of us, all of us are so used to doing, so used to caring for others, so used to just moving down through the checklist of the to do's, right? And being is really the counterpart of that. You know, we're human beings, and yet we are constantly immersed in activity. And so so really just being able to take some moments for self, some moments for connection to what you need, to what's important to you, um, and to really recharging and rejuvenating is, is really what we're going to explore a little bit today. And I'm just seeing, you know, so much going, going, through, the, going through the chat around loss and you know, just all of the, um, the suffering, right? There's just been a lot of suffering that people have experienced over this last year and a half. And so it's not about, um, it's about being able to both honor the suffering, to, um, to hold it, to have the capacity to hold it for yourself and for those that you are supporting. And it's also to have, just as much as possible to find moments of peacefulness or moments of calm, moments of ease, maybe even moments of gentleness, just as a way of counterbalancing the loss, the suffering, not making it go away, of course, but just really having some tools or some um, approaches to do a little bit of that, um, that self-care. So just, um, 
you know, just as we're, as I'm looking at the, at the chat that's going on and just in talking about thoughts and feelings and the kinds of things that have been happening, I'm just curious, what are some of the ways that, you know, that you have been feeling over the last few months? What are some of the ways that you've been feeling? Or what are some of the ways that you are noticing that, that when you are in a stress, in stress and reacting to stress, what are some of the, what are some of the ways that your, your mind, what are some of the things that you're saying to yourself or that you're noticing is going on? So put some things in the chat. So not being able to sleep. What other things have, have folks been feeling? Being more anxious, yes, harmony, yep. Okay, yeah. Oh, will it ever be back to normal? You know, it's such an interesting concept, normal, isn't it? Like we have this this thought about going back. Like the thing is, we're just constantly moving forward. Right. But I think what we're wanting is some kind of normalcy, right? Some kind of feeling of stability, of feeling like we have been in this time of uncertainty and it's just going on and on and on. Right. And so, so, so anxiety and worry, when we talk about what creates stress. So, again, there's all the external factors. We've been living in a pandemic. We've lost people and loved ones. We have had, you know, to, to change, to innovate, to manage so much more. And we also, my guess is that many of you have, have probably noticed that you have been worrying more. And worry happens when we're in that, so the, in that stress reaction, it's fight, 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 flight, or freeze, right? That is the, that is the chemistry, that is the nervous system reaction that happens, right? We go into fight mode, we just don't wanna deal with something, or we shut down, right? And, and the chemistry that's behind that has an effect on our mental state, has an effect on our body, right? We, we can't sleep as well. We have changes in our eating. We, um, our heart rate goes up. We don't, we don't breathe as deeply, right? We have all the effects of that chemistry makes our, all of our organs work harder. And in our mind, what happens is that we often get into states of worry. And worry is when we're thinking the same thing over and over again. And it's, I like this, this quote um, from Irma Bombeck, that worrying is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do. Like your mind thinks, oh, I'm doing something, I'm worrying. But it doesn't really get you anywhere. It's, I love rocking chairs, but worry, because what is happening in worry is we're always focusing on the worst possible outcome, right? I call it awfulizing and catastrophizing. So when we're always in the future, and, and especially in uncertain times, this is where the mind, especially in high stress, this is where the mind can go, is to get kind of stuck in a pattern of worry and staying in the future or focusing on the past. And so part of what we're, I just want to explore a little bit today is that we have some control over where our mind is and that when we have a little bit of control, because honestly, there's not a whole lot of other things that we can control, that when we have a little bit of control over where our mind is going, and what we're thinking about and what we're focusing on, that we have the opportunity to have more moments of peace, more moments of inner 
stability in our mind state, more moments of inner quiet, or more moments just of self-awareness. And so um, I just, so actually before I, um, well, I'll just talk about this for another minute and then I'll, I'll um, invite you to answer another question. So I want you to just consider something that your thoughts are not facts. And what I mean by that is thoughts are really electrical impulses. That's really what they are. And in our mind, again, from, from neurobiology, we're hardwired to look for danger. We're hardwired to focus on the negative. We're hardwired to say, am I safe or not safe? And again, when we go into those reactions, when we, when we really begin to, um, if you will, kind of let our thoughts um, kind of go, go wherever they want to go, it will often be in that automatic negative mind state and focusing on the worst possible things that can happen. And often when we get into these mind states as well, we're often super self-critical and judgmental. And we can just be really hard on ourselves. And that's really when I, I just really want to invite everyone to just consider that not everything that you think, it's not truth. It's the mind's way of trying to make sense of what's happening right in, in your, in your, in the moment, in your world. And that we can get into these automatic negative thinking patterns. And what I really want to emphasize here is that they're patterns. It's not that we're good or that we're bad or that we're right or that we're wrong. It's just that our mind on stress can really go to some crazy places. And I just want you to consider, so ants, I like to think of ants, um, not as the creepy crawly things that, you know, happen in the summer when you go on a picnic, but as automatic negative thoughts. And again, this is some neuroscience, just really basics. But I'm, I'm curious, just when you're thinking about some of these mental states that perhaps have been happening for you, if you just consider, have you heard yourself say to yourself, you know, what if, what if, like the what if, just that, the what if can be a big clue. What if means you're in the future. So what if I can't figure something out? What if I make the wrong decision? What if um, I say something or do something that doesn't have the best outcome? Or it might sound like shoulds. I should have said something differently, done something differently. Or it might go to, your mind might go to extremes like always and never, right? Or again, the self criticism and self-judgment can come up. So just in, in, the, in the context of patterns, and this is all I want you to um, just take a look at on the, on the handout. So on the handout, this pattern or these, um, these mind traps are there, just listed. And so I want you to just consider these different ways that our mind can, can go in um, into patterns during high stress. And so one is catastrophizing. And that's really what I just described, which is the what ifs and imagining the worst possible outcomes. And again, when thoughts connected to feelings, connected to behavior, right? When you're thinking what ifs, just consider that that amplifies feelings of anxiety, 
that when you are what ifing, that really what you are doing is you're scaring yourself. And so that, that there's that direct correlation between the what if. I love that, Valerie. So instead of what if I don't finish, to begin to reframe that a little bit and saying when I finish. So this is exactly the power of words. This is exactly the power of being able to notice your mind state. So that when we, the, another one is when you're exaggerating the negativity, exaggerating the negative, discounting the positive. So again, it happens. It's the always never language. It's when, you know, the yeah, buts happen. I talk about that, the yeah, but versus the yes. And the yeah, butting is, you know, when somebody says something to you and you're like, yeah, but, um, you know, it's never going to change or whatever, whatever it is, the yeah, but the, but means you've just discounted everything that has come before whatever that person has said. And the same is true for people like when, you know, they're talking to you, if they're, you say something and they say, yeah, but you know, what happens? We just get defensive, right? Because we're not really being heard. It's our way of saying, no, I don't really agree with you in a really kind of backdoor kind of way. And when that happens again, you know, there's so much just depression that's happening right now. Again, negativity, and when we're making assumptions, and that's really what mind reading is here, I keep meaning to change that. When we make assumptions, when we think we know what people are thinking and feeling, as opposed to just asking them, asking questions about what's happening for them, it just increases our stress. Suffering from the shoulds, which I just talked about before, and I, and I talk about, and this is just kind of some tongue in cheek humor, but stop shooting on yourself. So in the sense of, you know, again, language really matters. So when, when we say something as what we might not even think is um, a big deal, like I really should have, you know, called my, my sister yesterday. I really should have gotten up and gone for a walk this morning. Well, you know, you made it, you, the should is the guilt inducing. And we're going to talk about how to shift that into feeling just a little bit more positive, a little bit more in, in a sense of control. Because all the should does is just creates guilt and anger. And then blame. So another mind trap. And it's, um, again, just patterns, like whether we're blaming others whether people are blaming us or whether we're hearing blame happening because that's pretty much all that we hear in the world <laughs> on the news, uh, there's negativity and a lot of blame. It's very depleting. So I just, I want to just stop there and I want to, um, you know, this is on your, on your handout. I just want you to just reflect for a moment and I just want you to consider, have you been impacted or, or are you noticing for yourself any of these mind traps or patterns of thinking happening? And if so, I'm just going to encourage you to, to notice that, to maybe jot it down. And we're going to talk in just a minute about how to how to work with shifting perspective or reframing those thoughts. But the first part of doing anything is to just have some self-awareness about it. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here in a minute. And it would be super helpful for me to know, like any of these patterns of thought that have been happening for anyone whether it's catastrophizing, whether it's focusing on the negative and discounting the positive, whether it's making assumptions, whether it's noticing the shoulds, whether it's, you know, being, whether, whether you're the recipient of being blamed or you notice 
that sometimes maybe you blame situations or others. Just curious, just um, what if any of these mind traps or patterns is anybody aware of having? So Alicia, so I'm the type of person, I've been this way since I've been a child. Um, and I kind of credit it or I, I blame my creativity, but I'm a type of person and it gets me into trouble sometimes. I like to know the full picture. Mm -hmm. So even if I have a small capture of something, situation, it could be personally, professionally, whatever. Um, I like to, I want to know the end of the story immediately. And so I don't factor in that things could change as they go along. But I've already pictured in my mind what the end is going to look like. And uh, because I feel I, it's a way of protecting myself, feelings or emotions. Yes. And I, and what happens is when, when I think like that, I don't embrace change or if something doesn't go the way it's supposed to, um, it crumbles for me. Like, yes. you know, and if that's good or bad, if I want the outcome to be in my benefit or whatever. And, um, and I think it's just a, a, a barrier that I put up because I already know how it's going to end. And um, I'm expecting that when in, I don't leave room for what I don't leave room for letting things just happen naturally mm. Mm. Um, because I've already determined how the movie's going to end. Yes. So yes. that, you know, I struggle with that. Oh, Sylvia, thank you so much for sharing. And I would imagine that there are probably other people on this call that can relate to that. And, you know, I think it's, this is always the, that's just so interesting to me how, you know, as, as people, we want to plan, we want to know the end, right? We want to have that certainty and it is really challenging when we don't know that. And, you know, in this last, I mean, we could talk about just in general before COVID, but COVID has certainly shown us that, you know, we can't, we can't really know the end of anything. And that you're right, Sylvia, that just, it makes perfect sense how that causes angst. You know, like it's one thing, like, I hear, you know, from a creative, like if you're writing a story, right, of course you begin with the end in mind or you think about what the, what the, you know, plot might be, or if you're doing some other creative artwork, that might be true too. And, and in life, it's just, it's different. It's messy. And it, there's so many unknowns and absolutely, you know, being, you know, getting focused on one thing and then not having the ability to flex a little bit with it or to just kind of roll with it. I would imagine that that is, you know, that it works in some situations and probably not others. And, you know, the, the shoulds, the, uh, and yes, Robin, the catastrophe with all the violence that's happening. Yes. in black and brown communities and the shootings. I know I was just looking yesterday at all of the shootings that are, that are happening. Yes. And that's, you know, the, the weightedness of that, um, you know, of social injustice and just the legacy of that. I mean, there is, there is a, you know, there, there is so much to that. There's so many layers to that for sure. The what ifs. Yes, Lori. I shouldn't have second guessing a lot. Procrastinating. Yeah. Okay. So, so thank you for sharing those. And again, just to notice, because when we can notice something, we can do something different. We have, a, we have more of an option. We don't just get into the automaticness of where our mind has patterned us or is habitually taking us. So great. So now what I want to do is I want to just, whoops, I want to just begin to um, just really shift and talk about, okay, so you, this is the picture of how it has been, what's been going on mentally, emotionally in life. So 
we're going to, I'm going to share with you some, some mindfulness practices, which are about just being present, being aware, making some different choices in any given moment. And just before I do that, I'm really curious, what are some of the ways that any of you, when you're noticing these things that you just were just talking about, whether it's, you know, trying to just visualize what the end result's going to be or noticing that you're in the shoulds or procrastinating or just on the days when you're, you're just like, Oof, I just can't think of one more thing. I can't do one more thing. What are some of the ways that you have found that are helping you? What helps you come back to yourself? Or what helps you quiet your mind a little bit? Or what helps you just reconnect a little bit with gentleness or kindness or empathy for yourself or for others? What are some of the things that you are already doing? So N Stone, I'm sorry, I don't know what your first name is, but tapping into spirituality, what does that mean? Nordia, thank you, Nordia. So what does that mean for you, Nordia? Tapping into spirituality, patience, staying in the moment. Yeah, what else? Brenda, that's fabulous. Reminding yourself of your successes, of the good that you have done, the impact that you have had. Yes. The obstacles that you have overcome. Yes. Well, I love that. Take a nap. Recharging. So nap and rest and sleep is one of the most powerful ways to reset your nervous system. And if any of you, some of you just said you had said insomnia and having a hard time going to sleep. Um, I want to share something with you before we finish today that may be helpful. Prayer, prayer, having faith, higher power. Yes. Mm -hmm. Rebecca, spending time with your son. Yeah, being together. Great. Beautiful. So let's just talk about more possibilities of how to do that, how to do that, this just being part, because all of what we just talked about is when we're in the future or in the past. And here's how being here and now, even if it's just for moments at a time, can really make a difference. And, and I just want to share with you, so my journey to mindfulness practice happened, gosh, it was 30-ish years ago. So before I was a coach, uh, I was in the world of holistic healthcare. So I was a massage therapist, and I taught massage therapy for many, many years. And meditation and mindfulness practices. And part of how I got to that was I had um, a chronic, uh, I, I lived with chronic pain and it was very stress induced. I had a lot of, um, a lot of digestive issues, belly issues, lots of, lots of pain. And part of what was happening for me was that I was very much internalizing my stress. And what I found, one of the things that I found or that I learned were mindfulness practices. And I just want to clarify something that sometimes can be confusing to people is that mindfulness is not meditation. Mindfulness is literally just the practice of where am I putting the focus of my attention? And this quote from the Buddha, I just love this quote from the Buddha, that whatever one frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of his or her mind. And I always like to say, whatever you focus on expands. So focusing on the solution versus the problem, focusing on what you want versus what you don't want, focusing on peace versus focusing on chaos. And again, it's not an either or, but it's more about the inclination of the mind. And so 
So when we can, when we can just have these moments of being present, these moments of tapping into all of our senses, it really helps. It's, it's really the antidote. It's an antidote to the worry and to the anxiety. And so, and this is, this is from John Kabat-Zinn and some of you may know John Kabat-Zinn's work. He um, really popularized mindfulness-based stress reduction um, 30-ish years ago. So he's a doctor out of the University of Massachusetts. And what he did was he went and traveled the world and he really studied culture and he studied how people healed and the kind of healing work that, that was really effective. And what he found was that, you know, that spirituality played a big part in it. So, um, uh, Nordia, what, what you were saying before, you know, people's belief and faith. And the other thing that he also found was that when they could have get some sense of how they're, where they were paying attention and to do it in a particular way, like very purposefully and very much in the present moment with the, with the practice or the purpose of cultivating an attitude of non-judgment. Because again, judgment is hardwired into our brain and, and it's for our safety, right? Is it safe? Is it not safe? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it right? Is it wrong? And we go to the polar extremes, right? But non-judgment is more about how do we notice what's happening? How do we notice what's, what I'm, what, how do I notice what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, what's happening around me? And how can I just be a little bit more present with, with what is, and this is a great image. Um, I use this image. I don't know if anybody has um, dogs or takes, you know, takes dogs for a walk or how many of you have ever, I mean, part of this is just um, visually representing, this is how busy the mind can be, right? And if you've ever gone on a walk or you've ever been in a conversation with anybody, you like, you go on the walk, like how many of you have ever gone on a walk and you're like, you just completely missed the walk. You missed the sun, you missed the trees, you missed the people you walked by because you were so caught up in your head. Does that ever have happened for anybody? Or you're in a conversation with somebody and you're looking right at them and you have no idea what they just said. So it's, thank you, Brenda. Thank you for for validating my reality. So this is just what happens, right? We get so distracted. So again, human beings versus human doings and how can we be here and be present as opposed to just always trying to get there, right? And this is part of what we were talking about before. Yeah. So driving to work and not even knowing how you get there. That's right. So here's the thing. Many of you already practice mindful things. Many of you already do this. You've probably just never labeled it as this. So how many of you do anything that when you're involved in doing it, you just get totally engrossed? Like you are just, you're in it. Time goes by and you're just, you're just in kind of your own rhythm. You're doing your own thing. How many of you do anything like that? And it can be anything. It can be when you're walking, when you're gardening, when you're cooking, whether, you know, if you have a creative practice, when you're literally, it can be, um, it can be anything. Yeah. So it's, it's really getting attuned through your senses and just being all there. So what I want to, what I want to do with you is just a few different practices. 
Yes, writing for pleasure, journaling. Yes. Awesome. So for me, it happens when um, I love being at the ocean. So for me, I can completely just go into uh, just listening to the waves and listening to the feeling the sun. Like that just happens for me super easy at the beach. Um, it can also happen when I'm playing with my dogs, just being in the moment, playing with the dogs. So just noticing. So I, what I, what I want to just do, yeah, crafting, sketching, anything where you're in that right side of your brain, like so much through the day, we're in the left side of our brain. We're thinking, we're problem solving, we're listening, we're strategizing. And when you're in the right side of the brain, you're in that creative um, part of the brain, visual part of the brain. So let me just share a few different practices of mindfulness. And these are very simple and yet really powerful. Like these are really the foundational practices of just being a little, becoming a little bit more aware of what's happening for yourself for you in the moment, which then gives you the opportunity to potentially see things a little differently, make different choices. So the first thing that we're going to do is I'm going to actually invite you to just sit back a little bit. So if you've been kind of leaning forward, looking at the screen, literally just sit back a little bit. Maybe... Um, roll your shoulders back a little bit, drop them a little bit. And I would invite you if you want to maybe sit a little taller. So it's, it's not so much about sitting back and kind of slumping because we can all very easily do that. It's more about sitting up, maybe let your spine be a little long. And I'm going to invite you, if you feel comfortable, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes. And if you don't want to close your eyes, that is perfectly okay. Maybe I have a window that I can look out. Maybe you look at the trees. Maybe you look at the sky. Maybe you just find a spot on your desk that you can just rest your gaze on. But do something where you're literally just um, softening your sense of looking outward sense of seeing outward. So closing your eyes. And I'm going to take off my glasses just because that helps me just get a little more present. And all I'm going to invite you to do for this very simple practice for the next couple of minutes of mindfulness is to just become aware of your different senses. So first you closed your eyes or you softened your gaze. So just notice just doing that, what effect that had. Sometimes these little micro practices can just make a, a difference. Now, just as I had in the in the in the slide, one of the slides, imagine that your attention is like a spotlight. And I'm going to ask you to put that spotlight of your attention in different places. So now I want you to really put the spotlight of your attention on your feet. And I want you to just really feel your feet on the floor. And I want you to just really rest back into your chair or whatever you're sitting on. Feel the support of the chair. Feel the support of your spine. Notice your body temperature.
And now tune in to your sense of hearing. Do you notice any sounds other than my voice? And if you do notice other sounds, part of this practice is just to begin to notice the sounds as sound. Maybe you label them as sound, but you don't necessarily react to them as a distraction. It's just a sound that's happening around you. Now I want you to put your attention on your nose, on your sense of smell. Notice if there's a smell in the room that you're in. And if not, what I really want you to see if you can do is just really allow yourself to just really, as much as you can, pay attention to the breath going in and out through your nose. What does it feel like? Now notice your mouth. Notice if there's a taste in your mouth. And then I'm gonna ask you to be a little intentional and let your tongue relax down into the bottom of your mouth. And if you notice that you have a tendency to clench your teeth or if you hold tension in your face, I want you to see if you can just open your mouth a tiny bit, relax your jaw, soften your face just for the next moment or two. And now what I want you to also begin to notice is that you can actually notice your thinking. So you might have even just as I was guiding you in those three or four different things, you might have noticed that your mind was busy. You got distracted by a thought. You started just telling a story or making a shopping list or wondering what you were going to do next or later or whatever. A thousand things could come up in a second. And what I want you to do is to just see if you can notice just for the next two or three breaths that when a thought comes up, see if you can just notice it as a thought, maybe label it as a thought, as opposed to actually thinking the thought or talking to yourself in your mind of what the story is. And to just notice the thought and then to bring your attention back to the moment by just coming back into your body somehow. Again, notice the feet on the floor. Notice a sound or a smell, just come back. And if that happens a bunch of times, that's okay. Just keep gently encouraging your attention to come back into being in this moment right now. And then when you're ready, what I'm going to invite you to do is just slowly, gently, just bring your attention from the inside out. Ring a bell. So use the sound of the bell to come back as well. Now you might feel a little sleepy. You might need to stretch a little bit. So feel free to do that. So just noticing those, 
those, I'm, I'm just really curious, you know, when you, if you were able to just kind of notice those thoughts and maybe just let them kind of drift away or come back to your body. Like I'm curious, Eckhart Tolle wrote a fabulous book. It's called The Power of Now. He's written a number of books, but one of the books that I absolutely love that's on mindfulness is The Power of Now. Um, on Oprah's Super Soul Sunday, she has a great podcast. Um, she does a whole series with him on just what all like mindfulness is and all of this, um, these practices. But what he, what he says, what Eckhart Tolle just talks about is rather than being your thoughts and your emotions. So rather than just getting caught up in the thoughts or getting just swept up into the feelings to, to also be able to be the awareness behind them. So to be able to label that thought, to notice it and just let it float away, come back to your, come back to your body. So I'm just really curious, what was anybody's experience in just sitting for a few moments and just being aware of, of your senses, aware of your thoughts, aware of distractions? Tell me what it was like to just have the experience of just kind of sitting and being present. So I would just invite, invite you to just notice what you were aware of. Mm, less tense, more stable thinking. Oh, I love that, Lori. So really, that's really part of the whole practice of mindfulness is to be able to just gently bring your attention back in any given, in any given moment to just come back into the present. And you can do it in lots of different ways. Like you can do it in everyday activities, right? This is not just about, you know, sitting still and, and being and breathing. We're going to do another breathing practice in a moment. But it's more about how can I give my, how can I intentionally give my mind a little bit of a rest? And you can do that when you're just focusing on one thing at a time. And we have a tendency to multitask and we get even more and more distracted with technology and emails and everything else. But when we can just take the time literally to just, when you're eating, just eat. When you're walking, just pay attention to walking. When you're, you're taking a break, you're washing your hands. We've all been washing our hands a lot, right? Like to literally just slow down enough to like really feel the water on your hands, really feel in that moment, like even just notice your hands, just perhaps even be grateful for your hands. Like it's all of these little moments that we can just easily disregard. But every time, if you're standing in line, I used to get super frustrated standing in any line. And that was just an opportunity to just be present, take a few breaths. So these are just resources for you. There's, <clears throat> there's lots of different apps that you can use on your phone if you want to. Um, one of the apps is called Insight Timer, and it's a really great app. I've got a number of meditations or mindfulness practices out there. But um, if you have just a few minutes and you, it can vary, it can be helpful to be guided, right? Sometimes it's a little more challenging when you're trying to do it just on your own. So if, if you like guided practices, if you like, <clears throat> if it's helpful to have that, the great thing about Insight Timer is that if you have five minutes, they've got a ton of options. If you have three minutes or seven minutes or nine minutes, or you want a certain theme, or they have lots of them about helping um, to have restful sleep, they're there. You can also go to our website. So if you go to our website, tlstransforms.com, there's 18 
guided mindfulness practices on the website that you can just listen to. And they're all less than 10 minutes and they all have music and they all have something that's very inspirational, but it's really just something that is a helpful um, talk you through it uh, practice. All right, so I'm gonna stop that share. So I just wanna pause, just any questions or any thoughts about uh, just about mindfulness, about just using mindfulness as a as a tool or as a way of just being a little bit more aware, being a little bit more present, being a little bit more kind to yourself. Just or just any questions or thoughts? Does anybody? I'm curious if anybody does any particular um, practices of strengthening mindfulness. Does anybody do? So meditation is one uh, way of, of strengthening awareness and mindfulness. It just means sitting and focusing for longer periods of time. So what does anybody do? What does anybody do right now that is helpful to them in terms of whether you call it mindfulness or whether you call it relaxing or whether you call it, you know, um, letting go of the day, giving yourself a little bit of self-care. What is anybody else doing that you have found that has really supported you in having a little calm or having a little bit of peace? So yoga at the beach. Mm. That sounds awesome, Sheila. Walking. So let's, let me just invite you to do another super simple practice that's about, again, for me, finding calm in the chaos. Like when I am feeling myself get really anxious or I get really in that, um, worry headspace or catastrophizing or what ifing or any of those things. Breath is, it's the connection. It is the connection between our mind and our body and our consciousness and our unconsciousness. And so what do you notice when you are, when you are in a stress, when, when stress is high for you? What do you notice about your breathing? What does anybody notice about your breathing? Ooh, thank you, Rebecca. Relaxing music by P-R-Y-V. I have no idea how to say that, but great. Yes, so breath can get shallow. You might notice that you hold your breath. You might also notice that you breathe quickly. So here's the thing to counterbalance that, right? The relaxation breath, the calming breath, the shift your um, nervous system out of fight, flight, freeze, and into a little bit more control, calm breath is a belly breath. And we all do it. When we sleep, we belly breathe. If you have ever watched um, a dog, a baby, like when they're resting, they breathe from their belly. So when, when we can just sometimes, sometimes just shifting our body and becoming aware of our breath can support our mind state. So again, centering, and I probably have used these terms, but centering literally just means to bring your attention back from all of the places that it has been scattered throughout the day or in any given moment, your email, the phone, the kids, the dogs, the, um, all the things that need to get done, 
It's when you come back to yourself. And alignment is just like what I, I invited you to do whenever I asked you to just sit a little taller. Alignment is when you're standing, when you're sitting, when you're really letting your body, your spine support you. Feet on the floor, spine is long, shoulders are down. And again, I don't know about you, but I have been sitting and staring at screens a lot, right? So we can have a tendency to do that forward head posture, roll the shoulders forward. And so again, just doing things, all the simple things, back, bringing the shoulders down and back, stretching, getting up and moving, just doing whatever is the opposite or a difference from the pattern, whatever the pattern is in. So if you're sitting a lot and on the phone or staring at the screen every once in a while, literally get up and move, get outside, breathe in some fresh air and shift your body position. And breathing and belly breathing when you can do it and Laura you're saying you don't think savagely when I think that means when you don't breathe right or breathe I'm not quite sure what you meant by what you wrote there but literally when we have reactions to things when we have big emotional reactions we literally cannot think clearly the emotional brain takes over the rational brain the only way to get back into being able to cognitively and clearly think is through calming our body and through coming into awareness of our senses and our breath. And so it is the most simple practice to do, and it is one of the most powerful. And so I'm going to invite you to just do... Um, a little bit of breathing with me, a little bit of intentional breathing with me. And so again, just sitting back and this time again, sitting tall, Thich Nhat Hanh, he's a uh, Buddhist monk, teaches, has taught mindfulness practices for years and years. What he talks about is sitting like a majestic mountain. And the idea of that is to both sit tall, but it's also to have a sense of inner strength, right? If you think about a mountain, right? The, the foundation of a mountain, the stability of a mountain. So just sitting like a majestic mountain. And I'm going to invite you again to close your eyes or soft gaze. And to just let this be another few moments of connection to yourself. So again, you can always start by just noticing your body, feel your feet on the floor, feel your back against the chair. Just put your hands wherever you want to put them, rest them in your lap. And now this time, what I'm going to invite you to do is shine the light of your attention on the fact that you are breathing. And I don't want you to do anything differently for the moment. I just want you to notice that you are breathing. It is a miracle that you are breathing. It is something that we take for granted all the time. But your breath is your life force. It's energy. It's rejuvenation. So I just want you to notice that you are breathing in and out. And I want you to notice if you're breathing in and out through your nose or your mouth. And what I'm going to invite you to do is to just be super curious about your breath. Like paying attention to it like you've never really paid attention to it before. And I want you to just see and feel, if you can, just feel your breath moving in through your nose or your mouth. Feel the sensation of your breath. Feel how as you breathe down into your throat, down the breath moves through your throat, down into your chest, 
into your lungs. And your breath, as you breathe in, into your lungs, there's expansion that happens. And as you exhale, there's a release that happens, a filling up and a letting go. So just see if you can notice that movement, breathing in and breathing out. And then what I'm going to invite you to do, and again, if your mind gets distracted with a thought, see if you can just label it as a thought, perhaps let the thought just float away like it's on a cloud. And then see if you can gently bring your attention back to the stability of your breath. Because when you focus on your breathing, you are automatically focusing on bringing yourself into your own center. your chest, your belly, your heart. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite you to also just see if you can let a bit of softness happen in your belly. See if you can, see if you can let a little bit more breath go down a little bit farther. So maybe the breath goes down to your upper ribs, or maybe it goes all the way down to your belly button. Maybe even imagine or feel as you breathe down into your belly. See if you can imagine that balloon filling up in your belly and, and expanding as you breathe in, all the way around to your back and your low back. And then when you exhale, again, just let that belly soften and release. And what I want you to do is I want you to just see if you can gently invite your breath down into your belly for the next three breaths. Just really let your breath breathe you. Just really noticing the movement, your inhale and your exhale. And see if you can just with every breath in, perhaps even make it a little bit longer, slower, deeper than what you might do on in any other given moment. So you're just intentionally slowing down a little bit. So just one more breath in and one more breath out. And then when you're ready, just slowly, gently again, come back into the room, ring the bell. Again, you might yawn. Because this is what happens when, um, when we relax and we're awake. Because normally the only time that we breathe kind of in this deeper way or slow down is when we're going to sleep. And then the brain is like, oh, I'm supposed to be going to sleep. But the idea of mindfulness or mindfulness practices, how can I be awake and also be present and bring in just a little bit more ease? a little bit more fullness, a little bit more, um, a little bit more energy in a calmer way. So let's stop the share for a second. Oh, okay, Gloria, got it. So when the breathing is heavy, you can't focus. Okay, thank you. So just, what did anybody notice? Well, first of all, um, just give me, give me a thumbs up if you were able to soften your belly and let your 
Just bring your breath down into your belly a little bit. Great. And awesome. And how many of you, so just, I'd love to just hear a, a thought or a comment about just what did you notice with the breathing? So the breathing practice, as opposed to just paying attention to thoughts, was there any difference? Did you notice a different sense of relaxation or a different effect with the breath versus noticing thoughts? Mm. So Sadie's saying the first time I truly felt as if I could get a good sleep. So letting your, letting your mind and your body just really um, drop down into that deeper relaxation place. Great. So on the handout, so just so that you know, you know, really that breathing practice is here and it's, you know, you can just do three belly breaths. I mean, really, if it's, if you can just do three belly breaths in any given moment, a moment of crisis, a moment of, of big emotional reaction, a moment of, um, of any kind of um, challenge, if you can just pause, and this is the hardest part, is to pause and just take three breaths. Try to take three belly breaths before you react, before you say something, before you do something. It just, again, it helps the mind connect to the body, connect to the, the rhythm of your emotions, and it just helps keep the nervous system just a little bit more calm, a little bit more present. So let me just, just a couple more thoughts about mindfulness, and then we'll just, we'll finish up in a couple of minutes. So, so there's informal practices of mindfulness, and that's any time, anywhere. You're making dinner, you're focusing on making dinner, you're talking to your kids, you're talking to your kids, you're taking a walk, you're walking. Anytime you can tune into your senses. And the, again, the more formal practices which become more meditative are when you're sitting quietly and just letting your attention come to your breath, your body sensations, noticing the space, noticing space between thoughts is a fabulous practice. Noticing feelings, having something that you say to yourself can also be really powerful, you know, whether it's a you know, a positive reinforcement, something that's supportive. Again, just to counterbalance whatever the judgment, the criticalness, the negativity is, can just be a really, really simple and important practice. And this slide is here just to really be a reminder. And again, you may already know this or, or offer this with people that you're supporting, but just you can use your feelings as clues. Like if you're anxious or fearful, you're probably in the future. If you're, you know, grief can be present moment. It can also be, you know, if you're, if you get really stuck in depression or sadness, sometimes it can be because of thoughts about the past, um, ruminating, you know, sometimes being when we're angry or critical, we're just we're we're not in our in the present, right? We're outside of ourselves in the sense of just being really super um, um, judgmental. And you know, and so so just noticing when when feelings are happening, to just know that it's all it's also feelings and thoughts are momentary. They move. And even though we might have feelings for long periods of time, if you really tap into them and you're really aware of them in a mindful way, you can just get more present. 
you can, it can be a little bit more nourishing. Like this is part of what mindfulness is. It's noticing how we are being with a little bit more clarity, with a little bit more intention, with a little bit more ability to, in any given moment, have moments of relaxation or slow down long enough to be able to just tap into a creative part of our brain, a little bit of an insight or, you know, all of these, all of these little practices, things that you can do in one minute, in two minutes, in five minutes is really about how do you just get, get into a different, different state or a different rhythm. So getting off of the, the, just the cycle or the pattern of the automatic negative thinking and getting into the more peaceful, more calm, more focused, more aware practice. And a mantra is really just um, words that you use. There can be, certainly there can be, there are mantras that have been practiced in spiritual traditions for thousands of years and Mantras can literally be just connecting your thoughts with how you are breathing. So if you notice that you have a tendency to, um, to not be able to stay focused and present whenever you're trying to, sometimes it's really helpful to give your mind something to do. So a cue can be when you breathe in, your mind, give your mind something to say. So it can be anything. I feel, I am, I'm noticing. And not when you're breathing out, you know, it can be whatever that feeling or quality is that you want to cultivate more of. So breathing in, I feel. Breathing out, calm. Do it two or three times, right? Breathing in, I am here. Breathing out, I am present. Breathing in, I feel whatever feeling I'm having. I feel anxiety. Breathing out, I let it go. I relax. I soften. So it's really, it's really mindfulness and everything that we're just talking about today. The, the chaos is always going to be there. The external chaos, whatever the next uncertainty is, it is going to be there. And the practice is to just keep coming back to yourself, to keep coming back to the present moment, to keep honoring that you are a human being, not a human doing, to, to notice that moments can matter, minutes can matter. You don't have to sit and be, you know, super Zen for, you know, an hour. You can sit and take three belly breaths and it can make a difference. You can notice if you're saying something unkind to yourself or someone else and pause and, and make a different choice, right? That's really the power of mindfulness is to really help you. And this is one of my favorite quotes. I used to have this in my, um, in my massage office. It says, peace does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise, trouble, or hard work. It means to be in the midst of those things and still be calm in your heart. And we can all use more peace and more calm, especially in, especially now. Thank you everyone for being here. And I just hope that you can take something from today that was meaningful and just keep taking really good care of yourself because what you do is really it's really hard and it really matters and, you know, peace, give yourself some peace. All right. Thank you, everyone.